Hello everyone! Welcome to our second video lecture for our series on social statistics. And for this specific video lecture, we'll talk about measurements and indicators. So for this video lecture, we'll talk about different scales and levels of measurement. And then we'll talk about other typologies of variables that we may be using uh, throughout this uh, series of lectures. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we should code the data set and how do we prepare a code book. And in the end of this video, I will refer you to a newer video or to another video that will give the specifics of code booking. So here are some additional definitions that have not yet been covered, which should have been covered in the first video lecture uh, that are related to statistics. So before we get into the measurements, we'll need to cover this first. So let's first differentiate population and sample because we may be using these terms often when we talk about our activities for our statistics class. But I presume this is not new to you no so we have population so what is population so population is the complete set or aggregate of individuals objects or the score that the investigator is interested in studying in a given statistical project or in a given research so um again um population covers the universe no covers all of the possible data points that you can based on a specific eligibility criteria so when we say that this is a person uh, that the target population is um, uh, all of the active enrollees in a, uh, in a given university. Then in that university, if there are 751 enrollees, then the 751 is our population and population is represented by the big letter N. And then of course, population doesn't always have to be people now we have different uh, data sets or diff different units of analysis it can be for instance if you're talking about uh, data like uh, GDP or data like um, uh, population density so we're not really looking at individuals but our population are countries right so uh, Philippines uh, Malaysia United States United Kingdom uh, Ukraine etc so so the 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 number of countries that we have that's your the total number is your population so um we'll talk about more about the different units of analysis later so that's the population and then of course we have the sample which is represented by the small letter n so this is the subset of the population so usually when the population is too large and it's very impractical for you to be able to you know get data from all of the population especially if your population is really big like more than 500 then it's very impractical or very tiresome to really collect data from everyone unless you want to do a census right so um, there are different ways that we can do in order for us to select only a few amounts of people and then ensure that that specific amount of people uh, have or can already represent the whole of the population. So that's called sampling. So we'll talk about population and sampling in different uh, video lecture, but this is just an introduction to it. You know? uh, and of course, we'll also talk about what are the you know, threats that can happen in terms of the validity of your data if sampling is done incorrectly. But definitely, um, especially when we're doing research, you know, um, again, you know, it is very cumbersome, tiresome, and impractical to get all of the data unless you're doing a full census and you have budget for that. You know? But if you are a researcher dealing with a moderate size research project, then you have to, to do sampling. And there are mathematical ways, there are um, valid ways for you to be able to get a sample that will be able to represent the population. Now, any statistical result that comes from a sample data, especially if we cannot assure that that sample data can represent the population, is called a statistic. And the value is called the parameter if it quantifies the characteristic of the whole population so when it's a census then we can probably call it a parameter but it's if it's just a research project or an investigative project that relies on a smaller sample size compared to the larger population then we call all the findings in that specific um 
project is statistic. So let's get into the lesson proper. So let's talk about the different scales of measurement. So this is a very important lesson that needs to be imparted to you because um, when you are able to identify a specific value or a specific question in your research, it's um, its specific scale of measurement and it will help you in terms of choosing what specific um, research question or re what specific statistical uh, technique you will use to make the analysis. So the first scale of measurement is called the nominal scale. So nominal scales are numbers that are used simply to classify an object, person, or characteristic. So basically, nominal scales, the goal there is to uh, qual qual quantify qualitative data or quali quantify um, categories. So what are examples of um, values that are nominal in nature? So a good example would be sex assigned at birth. So you have male uh, and then female. And then for statistical purposes, we will assign certain values for them. Uh, for example, for males, we, have, we, we put one. And then for females, we put two. No, but it doesn't really mean that you know males are lower than females or vice versa. It's just that we're using, um, we're just using quantitative um, or numbers, no, in order for us to assign certain values. But nothing is really larger or or lower than a specific uh, the, in terms of the categories. No, so there's no form of ranking happening here. So what are other examples of nominal scales? One and one would be, for example, um, your um, type of residence. So if your type of residence is urban versus rural, usually we would have to code urban as one or and then rural as two. But it doesn't mean that urban is higher than rural areas. Right. Uh, another example of a nominal scale, for example, is um, month of birth. No? So you have January to uh, February, uh, January to December, and then you put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. No, and then the, it doesn't really mean like you have to really wrap them in terms of which is the better month, right? So that is another example of a nominal scale. So when you think about nominal scale, you think about categories no? instead of measurements. So this is the indicator that we're looking at for nominal scales. So next we have ordinal scales. So ordinal scales are similar to nominal scales because they're also categories. But unlike nominal scales, for ordinal scales, you're able to rank the different categories. All right? So it big sabihin, uh, certain categories have a greater weight or a, a greater value compared to the lower ones or lower categories. So for example... For example, we have educational attainment, right? So when you say educational attainment, um, and then your categories would be, let's say, elementary, right? And then you have uh, junior high school, senior high school, college, and then post-grad, right? So you do know that when you are categorized under elementary, you are of lower educational attainment compared to a senior high school, which is also of lower categorization or lower rank in terms of you know post grad. So, uh, like nominal, they are represented as categories and quantified as categories. Probably this one, two, three, four, five, but uh, you can arrange them in terms of which is greater, which is better. Um, than the others, right? So that's an example of your ordinal scale. And then the third scale of measurement is the interval scale. So for the interval scale, um, it is similar to the ordinal scale only because you can kind of line up the values of that specific scale or variable and you can identify which has a la high, higher score or a lower score or a higher value or a lower value. However, compared to your category, uh, your your ordinal variables, no, the distance or differences between the two numbers, no, or two values, um, are equidistant, right? Meaning they have uh, when the difference between 
uh, value A and value B and value B and value C are similar to each other. However, um, what is what is uh, important to know about interval scale compared to the next scale, which is ratio, is that it uses an arbitrary zero point, meaning there's no real zero point, uh, but it has equal interval adjacent units, just like the ratio scale, which will be discussed later. So an example, a common example of the interval scale is temperature. Temperature in degrees Celsius, right? So we do know that um, 45 degrees Celsius is hotter than or higher than, let's say, 25 degrees Celsius, no? But the difference between 25 to 26 and 26 to 27 is the same as 1 degree Celsius, right? So as you go from one step to the next, you know exactly the, dis the distance in between the two uh, each of the values. Now, unlike, for instance, when you go back to our example in educational attainment, you have elementary, you have junior high school and senior high school. You just know that junior high school is higher than elementary, but it's hard to quantify the distance between the two of them in terms of educational attainment. Right? Unlike here in in uh, this more numerical measure or more quantitative measure, you know exactly the distances between each point. No? But it's important that in interval scale, there is no zero point, meaning it's impossible for a certain... Uh, there's a zero here doesn't mean that that variable is gone. So for example, you have zero degrees Celsius. It doesn't mean that there's no more temperature when you say it's zero degrees Celsius. Um, because there's negative 1 degree Celsius or negative 2 degree Celsius and so on and so forth. And then you have 50 degree Celsius, one of the coldest places on Earth. Right? So it doesn't mean that nawala na yung variable or nawala na yung value. But still, it's, uh, it's just, um, it's not an arbitrary, it's just an arbitrary point. No, It's not an actual point that says there's no more of this variable compared to a ratio scale. Another common example of interval scales are those scales that make use of Likert scales. You might have already seen a Likert scale before. So we have one strongly, there's a statement, and then one means strongly disagree, two means disagree, three means neither agree or disagree, four means agree, five means strongly agree. So, and then you're going to get the average of all of the statements, however, however many statements there are, and that's going to be the score. But most of the time, you know, while, of course, the scores are equidistant to each other, there is no, uh, no, there is no full zero. You know? um, so that's an example of your interval scale. And then the fourth scale of measurement, sorry, I wasn't able to put the slide on that. And the fourth one is the ratio scale. So a ratio scale has the same characteristics as the interval scale of um, equal interval between adjacent units. No? However, unlike interval scale, this one has an absolute zero point. So an example of a, a ratio scale variable would be, let's say, um, uh, sales in pesos right so when you say sales in pesos so when you say so and what's again the meaning of equal interval adjacent units um you have let's say uh your sales is twenty five thousand, right and uh twenty five thousand one, no uh has a we know exactly what one peso is in terms of distance right but here when we say if the sales is zero it means that there's no sale right the value is gone so that's an example of a and that's your arbitrary point no zero means no sale and then if you go down it means that you have losses right before after that no? so that's an example of a ratio scale so in the social sciences it's hard to find a ratio scale um, usually ratio scales are for um, natural sciences or health sciences. Another example probably a ratio scale is, let's say, systolic blood pressure. It's the numerator that you have for the blood pressure when you have 120 over 80. So um, the higher, of, we know exactly that one millimeter mercury will bring you higher 
uh, blood pressure. And then there is a blood pressure that's zero, over zero, and that means that your heart is no more not no longer beating, there's no more tension in your blood vessels, and it means that um, you need to be resuscitated already. So, yeah, so there's a real. And then also, one of the things that is also common among ratio scales that can also be expressed in decimal points. Not to say that interval scales can't be measured, but mostly ratio scales can are more likely to be expressed in, in also decimals. So, in summary, uh, what are the uh, commonalities um, uh, and differences of each? No? So, uh, first, I would say that as you go from nominal to ratio, the, the data becomes more robust. So, it's always important that when you design your data collection strategy and your statistical analysis strategy, you prefer you know, going towards the ratio rather than making all of your variables nominal. Because um, when you don't have equidistant measurements and you cannot say whether something is a go of good value or not, or of higher value or lower value, it's hard to make those conclusions if the way you are measuring the variables are nominal compared to when you are measuring them in, in no ordinal. But between ordinal and interval, if you can make it interval, then it's better to do interval. Right, so all of these variables are labeled quantitatively, so check on all of the four. But uh, nominal variables do not have meaningful order, meaning um, there's no higher or lower value in a nominal scale. And then for ordinal, um, while there's meaningful order for ordinal, there is no measurable difference. So like, for example, the example that I said, whether uh, educational attainment there's higher and lower, it's hard to really tell uh, the amount of educational advantage quantitatively between a junior high school and a senior high school, right? And then, and so that is what interval and ratio has equidistance in between the, the different units of measurement. And then finally, for ratio, they have a true zero point, but interval values do not have a true zero point. Now, it's very important then that, you know, skills of measurement can be determined by the way you're collecting the data. Like for example, age, no, age can be measured interval, ordinal, or nominal based on how you collect the data or how you compute the data. I'll give an example. No? For example, how do we ask age in, to make it interval? So how old are you in years? No? So if you notice our questionnaires like that, no? how old are you in years? And they will write 25. So 26, 27, etc., etc. But you can make it ordinal if you ask it like this. Check among the age brackets in terms of, you know, your age. So you have 20 to 24, 25 to, 30, to 29, right? 30 to 34, etc., etc. Right? And then, uh, they will just check. The problem is, when you are 23 years old, you will check here. But if you are 29 years old, you will check here. So the distance becomes diluted. Unlike when you have here 29 and then you have 23, you maintain the seven steps distance. This one, that seven steps distance, and not really seven, six. That six steps distance is diluted into just one step. So you lose the robustness of the data. That's why when we measure age, we better just, you know, make it interval. And if in statistical tests we need it to be ordinal, then we can just transform it. But it's difficult to transform a data when you've already collected it, if you've collected it an, an, as an ordinal, and then move to interval. Right, so same thing. So how do can we also do interval for um for educational attainment? Yes, maybe you can like for example how many years of education have you had? So years is something that you can quantify, something that has an equidistance. However, usually we don't use that because that's hard to answer. So there are many considerations, like for example, you can in terms of income, right? 
um, you can ask them how much do you earn every month and then you ask them specifically the actual number, 24,500 per month. No? But sometimes, especially when you talk about household incomes, they don't, they don't remember household in their household incomes or their personal incomes to the dot, to the peso. So, and that, you know, that has, um, there's an issue of estimation. No? So, sometimes it's easier to estimate income brackets than actual income. Hence, you know, we will just put income brackets, especially if there are already meaningful brackets um, mm -hmm. that are provided by PIDs by PIDS, no? Philippine Institute of Development Studies. No? So, this, uh, when, you, when you design your data collection, your survey tool, no? you have to think about all these things. No? How, do I, how do I measure a certain variable in such a way that I make my values more robust, more leaning towards ratio rather than just nominal. But there are, of course, those variables that you, know, you cannot really make interval or ratio because by the nature of the variable, there, there's there have to be nominal, like gender. There's no way to make gender interval. Unless, of course, if you're doing more SOGI-based studies, you know, like they are going to, to plot themselves in a spectrum of SOGI. But usually, that's, uh, that's, that's not a very common study to do. You know? Sometimes, uh, all the study wants is to just know if this person is uh, assigned sex, is male or female. Right? So, that's that. Okay, there's another way for us to also be able to um, to describe the variables in terms of type and that is nature of variables. So the first nature of the variable is continuous variables. So continuous variables theoretically can have an infinite number of values between adjacent units on the scale. So it's also equidistant. So uh, to be very brief about uh, describing what continuous variables are. Continuous variables are those variables that fit within the interval and ratio scale. So if they're interval or ratio scale, automatically they're considered as continuous variables. So why do we put them together? Because most of the time, ratio scales uh, and interval scales, the statistical treatments that we use for them for descriptive and um, and inferential statistics are very much similar. So when I say that this is a continuous variable, you mean that I'm either talking about a variable that is within an interna uh, interval or ratio scale. And then we also have what we call discrete variables. Discrete variables, one in which there are no possible values between adjacent units on the scale. Uh, continuous variables can have decimal points, right? So for example, what is your height, for instance? So you have you can have 183 cm or you can have 185.2 cm. So, and, and it makes sense to have uh, 2 cm. But for example, discrete variables are only for counting numbers. So for example, of discrete variables is how many children do you have? So you have 2, 3, 5, how many children you have. But it's impossible to answer that question. You see, how many children do you have? 3.5. That's impossible. You cannot have 3.5 children. Right? So, that's the difference between continuous and discrete variables. But, for future purposes, I will always refer to interval and ratio scales as continuous variables. Although, there are interval and ratio scales that are discrete in nature as well. Next, we have categorical variables. So categorical variables, or sometimes called qualitative variable, is a variable that has two or more categories with no distinct ordering to the categories, right? So, um, so what are so another name for categorical variables, as we know, are nominal variables, right? And then when they have ordering, then they are the ordinal variables, if you remember. No? Now, there is a specific type of categorical variable that I have to take note and this is called the dichotomous variable. So dichotomous, it means that these variables only have two categories as their value. So example, is sex assigned at birth? So the answer is only male or female. Or are you employed or unemployed? The answer is only yes or no. So if the 
if the nominal variable has or nominal scale only has two categories, I would most likely call them or we would we can call them dichotomous variables. And again, it is important that when a certain variable has uh, we can identify whether a variable has two variables or three or more uh, categories because there's a different statistical tool that we use for two categories and there's a specific statistical tool for three or more categories. So uh, please take note of this because later on we will discuss, we will go back to this when we try to identify the specific inferential statistics. Next, let's talk about uh, types of data sources. So types of data sources, there are two types. We have primary data and secondary data. So primary data specifically is the data that the investigator you know, who is doing the statistics or who is doing the study is the one who collected the data. So the, the investigator designed the survey tool or designed the data collection process and then uh, their team, uh, them, they and their team were the ones who collected the data. So that's primary data. When you say secondary data, this is um, uh, this is data that has been um, pre-collected prior to the investigator's, you know, um, conception of the research. So, for example, of secondary data, probably you're an, an, an economist, no, who wants to look to see whether or not the Gini coefficient or the GDP has something to do, let's say, with the happiness index, no, or the happiness score of certain countries. Na? So, the investigator did not personally collect the GDP data, so they got this probably from World Bank, from a repository. So, if the investigator was not the one who personally collected the data or their team did not personally collect the data, then, uh, and they're using that data to analyze, then that's called your secondary data. Okay, so how do skills of measurement look like in a, in a survey? So, for example, for nominal dichotomous, it be like this. No? Sex assigned at birth, and it's a checklist, male, female. So, there are two choices, so that makes it a dichotomous nominal variable. So, for multinomial or more than three, three or more categories, an example would be a checklist, or a checklist, sorry, a uh, uh, a force checklist, hindi pala dapat squares yan, circle dapat yan, right? And then they check whether they're widows, separated, married, or single. Right? So that is for your nominal. Or for example, uh, pwede rin naman multi-checklist, but there's a different way of us, you know, transforming that data. For example, what SOC med are you on? So what so social media are you using? So we have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have TikTok, right? And then etc etc and then, then then they check. So again, these are examples of nominal. Why they're nominal? Again, categories but no specific ranks. So for ordinal, here are some examples for uh, survey instrument questions, right? So you have, for example, like are are often, um, no, you can have a checklist, no, an uh, observe uh, an objective checklist on educational attainment. So you have elementary, junior high school, senior high school, college, and postgraduate, and then they get checked. And then it's up to you to code them later into a variable or into a, to, to a number. Another question that is usually uh, ordinal is when you ask certain people or when you ask respondents to rank. Uh, certain items uh, in terms of importance or preference, etc. So, for example, you have your react the following in terms of importance and then they will score 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So, for example, family, career, love, health, and then, you know, again, these are categories, but now these categories have, you know, weights now have cut, have have ranking, no? Uh, they sa we can put a certain category higher than the other, hence it becomes ordinal. Next, for continuous variables, no, whether it's ratio or interval, so uh, how do they look like in, in scales no, or uh, in your questionnaire, in your survey form? So it can be like, for example, household size. Then you ask them just to write how the actual number here. No? And then we have scales and or indexes. Like, for example, there are sets of questions like the ones that you answered for this class. You know? There's a set of... Uh, statements and then they will choose uh, whether they agree or 
uh, they don't this they don't agree strongly or neither agree or disagree and then there'll be some computations that you will do you no know, in order for you to get the average or the mean of this and then that will be the score so that can be considered as an interval scale and also maybe you would take you know observation data meaning you're going to get quantitative information but this is not going to be responded to by your respondents no by people but it's actually you using your senses so an example for nominal for example you want to count how many uh sorry you want to count for instance um uh, if a certain guard no a certain security guard or personnel or employee is is the person uh mary wearing a mask so mask wearing so if you ask this are you wearing a mask strongly agree it's not very um it it you know it can be falsified no especially for social desirability causes so and then you're going oh you can have an observation checklist and then you just encircle if this guard is wearing mask properly then yes if not no and then that's nor nominal because that's yes or no right so that is the case so um there are also examples of um continuous variables right continuous variables that you can measure in terms of um observation like for instance you are you are doing census on a community and you're going house to house and for example you you count for example how many let's say how many uh how many people are living in a certain house at the given moment that you're visiting them and then you write in your observation checklist for so that's an example or for instance how many plants does a certain house have you know in that community and then you just you know write the discrete numbers there so that's uh that's how we collect observation data no but uh there are other also types of data that are nominal that can be collected and be categorized as nominal continuous categorical etc uh but there are these are biophysical data already and uh since we are doing social statistics then we are not um going to deal with that now it's very important that for especially for data that are categorical in nature, nominal or ordinal, uh, it's important that we quantify the data, meaning we we place numbers. For example, when when they when they answer male or female, um, in the spreadsheet it will come out as male and female. But before we, especially for really strict um statistical tools, now you really have to make them as numbers. Hence, you need a code book. No, that will tell you whether or not what what number should be assigned to males is it zero or one or what what number do we assign to females and that is you know that that uh, instruction manual is called the code book uh, which describes the content structure and layout of data collection a well document code book contains the information intended to be complete and self explanatory for each variable in a data file right so um so I will stop this specific um, video lecture here and will direct you to a video lecture that I previously made for, a, uh, for another class. And that specific video will have a, uh, a more detailed uh, explanation of how you can make a code book um, based on the type of data that you have for your survey.